Welcome everyone to my conversation with Douglas Headley. Douglas Headley is professor of the philosophy of religion and Cambridge in the faculty of divinity. And we discussed today his new anthology of the Cambridge Platonists co-edited with Christian Hengstemann. I'll link to the book in the description of our conversation. I'll keep this brief. We discuss the main influences on the Cambridge Platonists, but also the influence that they exercised during their own time, because quite often they are forgotten when we consider early modern philosophy. And they are quite strikingly important, also especially on the development of German idealism, as we will learn. And also today they can speak to us when it comes to questions of consciousness, questions of freedom and morality, but also how we understand the universe, if we just understand it as a machine, for example, as we've come uh, used to rather than an unsold cosmos as the Cambridge Platonists would understand the universe. But also, and this is perhaps most important, um, the relationship between philosophy and religion, also the relationship between Christianity and Platonism, which to some is oxymoronic and to others comes quite naturally. So I hope you enjoy the conversation. If you would like to learn more about the Cambridge Platonists, then please just follow the link to the um, to the book uh, on the Routledge website. I'll link directly to the publisher, so you might be able to uh, get a copy from there. And if you're interested to learn more about uh, Plato, you can also enroll in my Plato course. The link to that is also in the description of our conversation here. So I'd like to thank you all for listening. And also I'd like to thank Douglas again for taking the time to teach us about the Cambridge Platonists. Thank you all very much. Welcome, Douglas Headley. Thank you very much for taking the time. We're here to discuss your anthology of the Cambridge Platonists, a book that you co-edited with uh, Christian Hengstermann, published with Rutledge. I'll link to the book for anyone who's interested, so you can get a copy of the book. Maybe, Douglas, you could tell us, um, before we start discussing Cambridge Platonism, how the book came about and um, what it contains. Well, um, the book uh was the result of a major grant in a way from the AHRC but i'd been interested in the cambridge platonists for uh, many years and i really discovered them when i was in munich in fact working on a doctorate on the philosophy and theology of samuel taylor coleridge and I went out there <clears throat> wanting to explore the German background to Coleridge, uh, which is very profound. Both Kant and Schelling are very significant for Coleridge. But I also discovered that the Cambridge Platonists, whom I did not know, I'd never come across in my education hitherto, were also very important for Coleridge as well. So when I uh, put in for a lectureship in the philosophy of religion at Cambridge, I um, I told them that I wanted to um, bring back the Cambridge Platonists to Cambridge. Um, and uh, luckily enough, I was appointed. And so this longstanding interest then, then resulted eventually in a, a large grant. And this grant was largely online. So we put up the editorial work online in fact you can still access this but one of the key members of the team because i was working with a, a large team a fairly large team at the time was christian hengstermann who was a uh, a, a brilliant philosopher and theologian and philologist and we were interested in presenting the writings of the Cambridge Platonists in a thematic form. So many people will have who are interested in 17th century literature or 17th century theology 
And to some extent, history of ideas will have come across uh, Rafe Cudworth or, or Henry Moore or other figures uh, around the this group. But um, the selections, there have been a couple of anthologies previous to this one, were generally selections from each particular writer. So you'd get a selection of writings from Benjamin Whitchcote, who's thought to be the founder of the Cambridge Platonists. Uh, he was the master at Emmanuel in the early 17th century, or selections from Cudworth or Moore, perhaps John Smith, who was a very fine writer. Um, but we wanted to have a systematic anthology so that if you're, let's say, a philosopher or theologian or a literary scholar, that you could go to a text which would give you a selection on, say, the critique of particular thinkers and or if you want to have a sense of what their metaphysics is all about, say, for example, ideas of mind, body, uh, space, um, abstract objects, ideas, um, uh, ethics, uh, epistemology. So you could actually just look up a particular topic that you're interested in and find out uh, or, or, or at least discover a passage by Henry Moore or Cudworth um, on that on that topic. So that was really the the idea of the anthology. So you've mentioned some of the Cambridge Plato, and it's quite uh, ironic that you bring back the Cambridge Plato to Plato, and uh, through Germany to Cambridge, that, not to Plato. Yes, to Cambridge, <laughs> not via Germany. Yes, yes, uh, via Germany, <laughs> and that uh, Jakob Böhme as is pointed out in the book, I think, by you in the epilogue, is brought back to Germany via the Cambridge Platonists, for example. In a way, and, yes, yes. And yes, is greatly, yes. and also their influence and on the Pantheismus Streit through their um, work on Spinoza uh, is perhaps also pivotal. That's something we can discuss as well. Um, I'd like to know them maybe straight away. If I may interject, like if, if, course, uh, yeah. Johannes, Yep. Uh, in fact, one of the greatest scholars of the Cambridge Platonists was, in fact, a German philosopher, a very significant German philosopher, namely Ernst Cassirer, whose book on the Cambridge Platonists uh, has its limitations, and there's a big error there that I can point to, if you like, but it is one of the best books on the Cambridge Platonists. Yes, uh, go ahead, feel free to point out Cassirer's. Oh, well, the, the interesting, you see, the context of Kassira's book was um, a period of Deutsch Tumlerei in, the, in philosophy, right, in German philosophy. So <laughs> I, I probably I should explain what Deutsch Tumlerei is in, uh, for, for some of the, the auditors. Yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure I can uh, give a ready translation of it, but it's a sort of nationalistic uh, approach to the whole philosophical project so that you know you can only really do philosophy in greek or german and um as we all sort of know as we, as, well <laughs> we accept that but but there are some critics of this view now um uh Kassira was obviously troubled by what he saw as the uh dangerously dogmatic uh, dimension of, of a certain element of German philosophizing at the time. And he turned to the Cambridge Platonists as representing a kind of um, European ideal um, in these English thinkers, you know, who were men of latitude, so uh, figures with a, with a sort of breadth of culture uh, and uh, both intellectually and spiritually inquiring. So for Kassira, the Cambridge Platonists were a sort of intellectual model in that period of, of uh, German philosophy. In fact, he turned out he, he was disappointed by the Cambridge Platonists in the sense that his conclusion was that they were basically anachronistic. Essentially, they were late Renaissance thinkers and incapable of addressing the great questions of modern philosophy. Now, 
Christian Hengstermann and I really wanted to show that this is false um, and that, in fact, uh, Descartes and Spinoza uh, and Hobbes, of course, are very significant conversation partners for the Cambridge Platonists. And even Burma, right? So we might think yeah. of Burma as a very odd figure and understandably, and today he tends to be categorized among the esoterics. But mm. in his age, in his period, of course, Burma was um, in many ways a uh, deeply characteristic figure in that in that period. So, um, so both Christian and I were convinced that Kassira was quite wrong about that. And so if you look at the book, you will notice that it starts off really, I mean, after the sort of introductions, with um, critiques of well, John Calvin, because of the mm -hmm. dominant Calvinism in Cambridge, which is a, is a very important aspect to understanding the approach of the Cambridge Platonists, but then Hobbes, who of course is a deeply modern thinker, yeah, albeit yeah. a humanist at the same time, mm -hmm. and then Descartes, and uh, uh, after the, the critique of Descartes, Burma, and indeed Spinoza. So here we're looking at the, one of the earliest critiques, for example, of Spinoza. Um, so that's, I think, where Cassira got it wrong. Cassira is presenting the, the Cambridge Platonists as well-meaning, but ultimately anachronistic thinkers is, I believe, mm. a mistake. So he thought them to be antiquarian Platonists. Stuck exactly. 400 BC somewhere, maybe some Neoplatonism mixed in with it, but uh, not, not, exactly. really, not really in touch with the discourse of the time. Exactly. Which, and I mean, which, it, yeah, sorry. Go no, no, no. I mean, I mean, I think that uh, really, again, one of the key themes of the book is that they are or they constitute the most important group of Platonists between the Italian Renaissance and the late 18th century, early 19th century Hellenism, yeah. which is such an important part of philosophy in that period. And this sentiment by Casira, we can perhaps, not because of Casira, but to some degree is reflected also in how in our curricula, when we learn early modern philosophy, usually the Cambridge Platonists are not mentioned. There's one exception, uh, that's just to read, uh, mm, yeah. I read uh, early modern philosophy with. So he, I did read a bit of Henry Moore with him at King's College in London, but um, apart from that, usually we learn the British empiricist, obviously before that would be Descartes, maybe some Hobbes um, and uh, maybe the early Kant or so, but that would be usually it. Uh, but they are, you quote here from Cutworth, this is on page 323, the British empiricist from Locke to Human Read, um, that I find they, they are very aware of what is the discord at the time. So here we have this quote, wherefore the same Plato tells us that there had been always, as well as then there was a perpetual war and controversy in the world, and as he calls it a kind of gigantomachia. Mm -hmm. You would pronounce that differently. Battle, yes, yes, Battle of the Giants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, betwixt these two parties or sects of men, the one that held there was no other substance in the world besides body, the other that asserted incorporeal substance. So between, yep. to put it simply, between realism and idealism or empiricism yep. and idealism, uh, by the way, to, you know, you might know this, Heidegger quotes this um, section or this passage from Plato, the Gantumachia Peditas Musias on the first page of Being in Time. Mm -hmm. yep. Uh, yep. And so they must have been not only aware of their Plato, but also of what was going on at the time. And they present uh, middle position or so. I mean, you refer you refer to it as a metaphysics of spirit. Yes, I mean, well, I, 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 so one way, obviously, of thinking about early modern philosophy mm -hmm. is precisely as a battle between the gods and the giants. Yeah, 
i.e. between figures like Hobbes, who would represent the giants, right? So we do our philosophy from the bottom up um, to figures like Leibniz, who uh, are on the side of the gods rather than the giants in that uh, it's a metaphysics that in many ways is a top-down metaphysics. And the uh, so I would say that the Cambridge Platonists are on the Leibnizian side of things. And in fact, the, the, there is a link to, to Leibniz. Obviously, Leibniz is a slightly later figure. But there's a, a link via Henry Moore's heroine pupil, Lady Conway, um, and a very intriguing circle at Ragley, the country house where she was the... Um, the, the the great mistress and uh surrounded by a number of significant intellectuals of the age uh franciscus mercurius van helmont and uh christian knorf von rosenhort the great kabbalist of the uh, late 17th early 18th century and leibniz was linked into that circle so there's a there's a, an idea or theme that um, or rather idea that Leibniz was himself influenced by the Kabbalah and that the uh, influence of the Kabbalah in Leibniz was in part via this circle that included Christian Knorr von, von Rosenhort. So I would say that uh, in if you want to see philosophy as a contrast or early modern philosophy as a contrast between the, the gods and the giants, the Cambridge Platonists are definitely on the side of the gods, right? So they want a top-down approach to philosophy in which we have to think about the material world primarily in terms of the spiritual and rather than take the Hobbesian approach and try to understand the spiritual or the realm of value or order uh, from the material and the contingent so uh they are of course they're they they are uh, platonists and uh, more specifically i would say they are alexandrian thinkers so the key influence is coming out of the world of origin and late antique alexandria and but via Ficino and by the uh, Renaissance transmission of this late antique world, uh, but it is very much one that's engaging with the uh, nominalist, empiricist, mechanistic challenge emerging out of this uh, version of the giant's position that we find in figures like, like Hobbes. Perhaps, perhaps, could you describe a bit more? So they are, they are the antidote to materialism and atheism. That's how they perhaps also see themselves. Sure, sure, sure. Um, and perhaps to to listeners who aren't uh, too familiar with those two movements uh, or schools of thought, perhaps you could describe them briefly. Um, and I mean, atheism should be obvious to most, but maybe not so much uh, materialism or mechanism, um, as we maybe take that for granted. And then also how the a metaphysics of spirit really does uh, differ from that. Well, um, I think one way of thinking about this is the critique of Descartes. Yeah. Because obviously, I think Descartes was seriously worried about the implications of a strictly materialistic yeah. view of Hence the human beings. Yeah, okay. Yeah. 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 So um, now, of course, uh, one of the uh, questions that almost every beginner in Western philosophy has to uh, encounter is Descartes' solution to the problem of materialism, uh, a, a mechanistic view of reality, in which human beings are to be understood as just objects alongside uh, other objects in the cosmos. Uh, and on the sort of Hobbesian version of this, uh, deterministically, 
right? So uh, that's been a nightmare for many of those thinkers, not necessarily religious, uh, but certainly for those with some uh, religious belief, but even thinkers who've been concerned about questions of ethics and responsibility, right? So how can something like the justice system uh, operate if you know, one is committed to a materialistic, deterministic uh, view of, of human beings as just items like any other items in the empirical world. Now, the problem, obviously, with Descartes is that uh, his way of salvaging uh, the dignity and freedom of of the human being comes at an enormously high cost, i.e. that the distinctively human, uh, the cogito, seems to be uh, divorced from uh, its material uh, component. And so we end up with this you know, massive division that uh, many philosophers, even those on the side of the uh, giants from uh, you know, Leibniz uh, onwards, uh, uh, try to avoid. And uh, whether you have uh, pre-established harmony or whatever other solution, many uh, philosophers who are in sympathy with De many of Descartes' aims, they just want to avoid that you know, radical division. And the Cambridge Platonists are, are an instance of that. And one, um, this has various interesting aspects. So Henry Moore attacks Descartes for his view on animals, right? So... Because, of course, that radical division between the human cogito um, and the uh, and animals means that animals are just machines. So they are simply part of this extended mechanistic world. And uh, more points out the implausibility of, of this. You know, we just know that animals are not uh, machines and don't behave like machines. And you can also see it in the attempts of both Cudworth and more to develop the idea, some version of the world soul. So uh, Cudworth calls it plastic nature. Um, more talks about the hylarchic spirit, um, but the an idea of nature as itself animated and and a rejection of this radical division between a mechanistic nature and then the realm of spirit, which is the realm of of cogitation or, or or thought, so I think that that uh, attempt to hold on to the axiological significance of thought and freedom, right? There must be something of intrinsic value in our capacity to you know think about abstract objects to. Uh, have a sense of past, present, and future, you know, the whole conceptual apparatus of the human mind, uh, linked, of course, to uh, ethical and and political considerations, issues about justice, etc., that they want to defend all of those axiological elements, but without uh, bearing the cost that the radical dualism of the Cartesian model uh, seems to imply. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm in full agreement uh, on, on Descartes. And I also think that he's terrified of a crude mechanism and wants to, and also in that he's a precursor then to transcendental Kantian freedom, really, yeah. Uh, yeah. with that notion, um, uh, but maybe takes it a bit far <laughs> in his attempt uh, to... Um, Safe but I should also freedom. say that they yes, have please. sympathy for for Descartes as well. I yeah. mean, they're not, yeah. you know, it's not the 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 the. Uh, in fact, Moore says at one point that he wants to combine Cartesianism with with Platonism. Yeah. Uh, so it's not a complete rejection of of Cartesianism, and I think this is one reason why they're interesting at the moment because, you know, when, uh, characteristically, when we study philosophy in the West. We're often um, brought up to look for the evident errors in Descartes. So, so we're given the meditations, but we're we're given the meditations in a sense to discover what's wrong with it. Yeah. Uh, 
And, you know, maybe one of the uh, interesting aspects of much of 20th century philosophy in that respect was the, the radical anti-Cartesianism mm -hmm. that itself becomes rather problematic. I mean, clearly, uh, uh, the most extreme instance of this would be behaviorism, right? Yeah. Um, so I think figures like like the Cambridge Platonists, like Leibniz, become interesting when you want to say, well, given the problems with Descartes, what what is there of value and interest in the Cartesian position? And you know, to what extent might Descartes have been right about some some of these questions? Um, maybe just briefly, this, it might sometimes be down to, especially Heidegger, of course, could be we could mention as someone to blame here, perhaps because he takes, especially the young Heidegger, is to him yeah. Descartes is his nemesis. Uh, and he sees him as the godfather of modernity and the beginning of all ill, yep, yep. Uh, practically. Um, but when we just perhaps briefly, the reed cogitans or reed cogitans, the thinking thing, there is a, there's a certain activity also expressed here. It's not just a thing that has a certain property. It is in the, in the Gerondif, uh, there's an activity expressed here, I think. Um, but Perhaps this is a good way to uh, perhaps mention briefly your you because you, you identify four areas of relevance at the end of mm -hmm. the of your introduction, your philosophical introduction. One of them is consciousness, and another one is freedom, um, and also the understanding of the universe as a machine. Mm -hmm. And I'll get to the relationship of philosophy and religion later on. But those three, perhaps you could speak on those now where the Cambridge Platonists are still relevant to the question of consciousness, freedom and morality, and also the mechanistic view of the cosmos. Yeah, well, I suppose when I was starting off uh, as an undergraduate in Oxford, studying philosophy, um, the, the question of consciousness was... Uh, uh, obviously a very significant question mm. but it was one that generally philosophers thought had been sorted out in some way or other it's just that there hadn't yet been a definitive version of the uh, solution to the problem and what is i think particularly interesting in the meantime uh is that uh not only has the problem not been solved but it has uh, morphed in rather strange ways. So now, panpsychism, which uh, yeah. you know, twenty or thirty years ago would have seemed a completely weird uh, doctrine, probably something that you might find in the esoteric section of your bookshop, but certainly not in you know, kind of major philosophical uh, domain, uh, has. Has come back with a vengeance, and and so you know, uh, Thomas Nagel uh, suggested that panpsychism might be a route uh, out of the problems uh, facing the, the whole problem of consciousness. Uh, he doesn't develop it, of course, but since then, a number of uh, significant philosophers, such as you know Galen Strawson, uh, have been uh, advocating it. Of course, Chalmers. Um, yeah. Is, is sympathetic to it and uh philip goff in in the uk has been um a very uh, uh energetic evangelist now the uh the cambridge platonists i don't think are panpsychists actually but they come quite close to it in some respect so particularly with this notion of the spirit of of nature but that would be just one uh instance of why the questions they're raising are, are of great significance on the issue of uh, freedom, I would say uh, that is, of uh, uh, course, of continuing relevance for the um, Kantian reason that uh, morality presupposes freedom. So, yeah. uh, you know, what do we, what kind of model of morality can we have or ethics without a substantive model of freedom? So 
that's a um i i think a a realm in which their thought remains relevant and again interestingly one of the big differences between uh you know the 1980s when i was an undergraduate and now i think is that uh in oxford then the dominant view was some form of projectivism some form of anti-realism in ethics as the viewpoint that cohered best with again a radically naturalistic reductionistic materialistic sometimes even deterministic view of the human being now, um, now since then uh, ethical realism has become much more popular well the the ethical realism uh, raises the question that Mackey uh, developed of the queerness of those uh, items that we're referring to if we think that um, there are such things as as ethical facts if there's some objectivity to the to the ethical so in the realm of ethical uh, in the realm of ethics I think they are particularly relevant and the third issue the first was consciousness the second was freedom and the third was um the well you just have it much nicer than me the mechanomorphic model of the universe oh yeah 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 exactly yeah exactly yeah so so the um i mean obviously the 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 idea of the universe as a machine yeah is uh, uh as a metaphor I mean, it's it's, it's you know, we make machines, right? So yeah. there's something deeply anthropomorphic about thinking of the universe as a machine. Now, it's it's obviously uh, been a highly productive uh, model, mm -hmm. uh, but since we're interested in metaphysics, then we want to think about the perhaps the limitations of such a such a paradigm yeah. and then finally i would say that that leads one on to the well onto a theological dimension yes. right yeah. so uh one of the reasons i think is is um, why the cambridge platonists are significant is because they also want to explore these deeply philosophical aspects of religious belief mm -hmm. so there's a form of analytic theology or philosophy of religion that has become particularly significant in the last few decades which basically takes the belief in god or the human soul as a, a given and then explores the conceptual difficulties contained within a particular um, idea of God. So you know, can we think of God as being simple or can we think of God as being pure actuality? What are the problems? How is that compatible with the idea of God being personal, etc.? And uh, similarly, with the idea of the uh, the human person as soul or the possibility of um of resurrection or immortality now the cambridge platonists do not take either the existence of god for granted nor do they take the existence of a uh, soul worthy or otherwise of uh, redemption for granted mm -hmm. so they, uh, in this sense they are bottom-up thinkers right so at this level they do want to address the atheists on a kind of common ground they want to address the concerns of the agnostic uh, and they want to come up with reasons for thinking why uh, the idea of god mm -hmm. might be philosophically uh, coherent and in fact they think obviously that it is coherent and ex explanatorily significant um, and indeed why a particular view of the human being as having a spiritual telos uh, fits into uh, an otherwise respectable scientific uh, worldview so i think they are 
of relevance to a modern world which no longer takes the theological for granted and which you know wants to know well why uh should one uh believe in a transcendent realm uh, and what's the significance of that for a life well lived and they present us with uh, rational justification, for example, also for salvation. I noted down a quote, actually, there's a line from you. Salvation is the renewal of the soul through the indwelling of the eternal logos in the spirit. Yes, yeah, yeah. Maybe That's you could right. expand on that. It's one of the most beautiful uh, sentences I found in the book. Right, well, idea. yeah, I mean, basically, uh, they are, and this is partly in reaction to the Calvinist upbringing. So you might say there's a Freudian element to this dimension of their theology. They are opposed to a forensic model of theology, right? So they are opposed to models of penal substitution, um, to a model of human salvation as being uh, narrowly forensic in, mm. let's say, broadly speaking, a certain Anselmian-Calvinistic uh, paradigm whereby um, Christ steps in and substitutes for the otherwise requisite punishment of humanity for uh, its sinfulness. Um, instead of this forensic model of salvation, the Cambridge Platonists are more Greek than Latin in that they see salvation in terms of deification rather than the removal of this otherwise unbearable uh, demands of uh, punishment from a wrathful God. So in many ways, it's a meditation on the on, on, on an element of the Christian tradition that other philosophers have remarked upon in intriguing ways, including Hegel. Uh, of course, I'm thinking particularly of the, the uh, early writings of, of Hegel in the Frankfurt period. Uh, which is tied to um, the letter of John that God is love. Um, and what is the meaning of, of this otherwise extraordinary claim that is, of course, nonsensical to a Stoic um, or, to a, or to a Buddhist, uh, but is right at the heart of the of the Christian tradition. And of course, they felt that a certain version of Christian theology was not only off-putting and uh, problematic ethically, but also in contradiction to a key theme of Christian theology itself, right? So, um, so their critique of double predestination or the you know the arbitrary deity of, a, of a, a certain theological tradition was tied to this profound conviction that to say that uh theos or theos agape estin is mm. is that god is love mm. is a claim of profound metaphysical significance and that should be dealt with as such just briefly, uh, Goethe came to mind. Uh, Jeder sei auf seine Art Grieche, aber er sei es. Everyone shall be a Greek in his own way, but a Greek yeah, yeah. he shall be regardless. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. had to throw that in. Um, you, as we're on the subject now on of, of Platonism being married with Christianity, Anthony Tuckney, who you mentioned, um, and uh, you also uh, here point out a more recent... Um, uh, the contemporary philosopher of religion, William Lane Craig, claims that Platonism, with its doctrine of uncreated eternal and mutual verities, is more threatening to Christianity than the problem of evil. 
So how can there be a Platonistic Christianity given that the forms are uncreated, for example? So that would be one of the issues, obviously. Maybe there are other issues as well that you'd like to point to. And how can they bring those two together? Well, I mean, the answer to that was uh, discovered in um, the Platonic school itself uh, and the, uh, the uh, in, in Middle Platonism, whereby the, the ideas became uh, thoughts in the mind of God. Yeah. So uh, obviously the, the, the sort of critique that um, a figure like Lane Craig, who I have great respect for Lane Craig as a, as a philosopher and a thinker and as a Christian apologist, but that is um, a, 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 a critique that the Cambridge Platonists would find hard to accept, um, except that um, they might link it to a concern for God's goodness, which, of course, from a certain perspective, might be seen as incompatible with divine sovereignty. Right? So this is a classic divide in the Western Christian tradition between, let us call it on the one hand, the essentialist position, and on the other hand, the uh, idea that gods should be defined primarily in terms of his will or the voluntarist position right now uh in augustine you have a mixture of both in a way i mean the late augustine becomes voluntaristic but the early doc but the early augustine uh, particularly when he's talking about the divine ideas, uh, is close to the essentialist position. And uh, obviously both uh, views of the deity have their problems. Uh, the uh, voluntarist view of the deity, which stresses divine sovereignty, uh, uh, can look like... Um, well, the Cambridge Platonists would certainly say it's, it's a god not worth having, right? So this is uh, some uh, monarchical, and not just monarchical, but tyrannical uh, vision of the deity. But the essentialist uh, viewpoint, which, by the way, is the view of Aquinas, as well as the Cambridge Platonists, is that um, God's being is, of course, limited by his goodness, right? It doesn't make sense to think of God as not good and somehow his uh, sovereignty trumping, trumping his goodness. Uh, that's just a misconception about the idea of God. But obviously, these are deep metaphysical waters. It's just to say that uh, the Cambridge Platonists are on one side of the divide. And if that's a problem... Well, uh, uh, it, it's one of those, I think, recurring difficulties within the theological tradition. But certainly we shouldn't uh, become upset about it because of a misconception of the relationship of the ideas to the, the deity within Christian Platonism. In Christian Platonism, which, it get, which itself is a contested notion, right? So some very great scholars like uh, Heinrich Dürer uh, and to some extent Mark Edwards in Oxford would say, look, Christian Platonism doesn't make sense, right? Platonism was the dominant school in antiquity of the pagans, right? So Christians, by definition, however sympathetic they were to Platonism, had to do something different. Clearly, at a sort of socio cultural level, that's uh, true. Um, on the other hand, it's remarkable the extent to which many of the great thinkers in the Christian tradition from Origen to, to Augustine, Boethius, uh, just took on uh, a great swathe of uh, Platonic 
um, metaphysics. And indeed, even Augustine says in his Confessions that when he's talking about the influence of the books of the Platonists, he says that he read among these Platonists um, about the Logos. Uh, what he didn't read was that the Logos became flesh, right? Now, that's very interesting because it shows how much he's in agreement with those pagan Platonists um, that uh, he's he's happy to accept a great deal of their metaphysics. It's just his disagreement is over the idea of the incarnation. So uh, obviously those are, are big questions about you know the relationship between Christianity and and Platonism, but for understanding the Cambridge Platonists, it's uh, just important to to recognize that they are within a living tradition, and within this living tradition, um, they are um, they're just really not worried about Athens and Jerusalem. It's it's just not a um, a, a concern for them, as of course it was for contemporaries like Pascal. They rather married them, would you say? They, well, they yes, exactly. Yes. Yeah. 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 In fact, their way of marrying them seemed a bit weird. I mean, to us, that, uh, you know, Plato is the Attic Moses, right? So basically... Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it is a view, Heuchlin, the, the great tubing yeah. figure, was, was seemed to be the source of this view that... Um, well, it goes back to antiquity, of course, but... but um, but I was also struck by, as Tübingen was just mentioned, yeah. uh, as you know, that Tübinger Stift yeah, yeah. is where Hölderlin, Schelling, and Hegel, uh, who knows why, end up uh, in the same room. Um, and I, th I think it was Schelling or Hölderlin who wrote in Hegel's uh, Tagebuch in his diary, Enkaipan. Yeah. One all, yeah. Or one is all, depending. It's, but this seems to have traveled back to Germany again through Cutworth. Yes, yes. I was not aware of that, uh, but it's mm -hmm. it. Th th this one line, these three words really spark German idealism. Is the mm -hmm. attempt to, as you, this is on page three hundred twenty nine for anyone who's reading along, and in your introduction, again on page sixteen, I just read this out because this fits in well with this. I think. The philosophical theology of the Cambridge Platonists culminates in the vision of a unity that thinks itself, creates the visible cosmos in its own image, and both calls and impels the return of the world to itself. In this sense, the problem of identity and difference, two of Plato's great categories, become models of both the imminent and the economic life of the divine. Mm. So the Henkai Pan, perhaps you could expand on that a little bit, but also distinguish it from pantheism and the spencistic fashion. yeah yeah um by the way in parenthesis uh when i referred to reuchlin it was the idea that pythagoras was in fact jewish right so pythagoras becomes a link between plato and the uh and moses but yeah no the henkai pan is this is um again i think this has been neglected or by mm -hmm. the by the scholarship the influence of the cambridge platonists in um 18th century Germany, because uh, one of the uh, pupils of the Cambridge Platonist, Shaftesbury, was immensely significant in uh, 18th century uh, German literary circles. And uh, Henry Moore was particularly significant because of his uh, inclusion, or a number of his works in Christian Knorr von Rosenhort's Kabbalah de Nudata, so, which again was another key text in the 18th century. So Goethe and others will have you know, read Henry Moore in that context. Now, the, the um, influence of Cudworth comes through another strand, and that's really through patristics. Again, this may seem puzzling to people who are used to contemporary philosophy, but patristics was of immense significance uh, in the early modern uh, period. And um, Cudworth's true intellectual system of the universe was 
translated into Latin by the Erasmus of the 18th century, Lawrence von Mosheim. And this Latin translation, which uh, there was in fact another later edition in the 18th century, with Mosheim's very extensive notes, and sometimes indeed Mosheim's alterations, became a textbook in Reuchlin's uh, Alma Mater in Tübingen, uh, where Hegel, Hölderlin, and uh, Schelling were, were studying. Uh, in fact, there's we know that Schelling used this, uh, the, the Mosheim text, because there's a manuscript in the uh, Berlin uh, Staatsbibliothek, uh, which has a citation of Plutarch from uh, Schelling that he took from the, the Mosheim. So that's, you know, we're not just guessing that, you know, this was the book around. We know that Schelling was using it, and it's almost certain that the others were. And the Henkai Pan is one of the instances, because um, Cudworth is using the language of Henkai Pan uh, in the true intellectual system of the universe uh, to discuss what he refers to as cosmotheism and uh, precisely to uh, consider the uh, what he also defines as hylozoicism, so so the hylozoic position of those like uh, uh, Spinoza, who are presenting a basically pantheistic model of the universe, and Cudworth is uh, sympathetic to these pantheistic approaches, but at the same time critical of them, and it's in this context that he wants to show that monotheism is superior to pantheism, uh, that the term Henkai Pan emerges. And uh, although the exact uh, formula Henkai Pan is the result of Morsheim's uh, recalibration of the uh, the Cudworth original. So, um, this text, which was uh, standard reading in Tübingen, so uh, uh, that's the source of this particular particular formula. And how would you distinguish this um, the Henkai Pan of Cutworth from because they were opposed to pantheism? Just put it simply. Yeah, because how because um, obviously the uh, key to the um, Spinozistic model. Yeah is the uh, resolute rejection of the personality of the first principle. Mm -hmm. right? So Spinoza makes this clear that we can't think of the divine substance as, as personal. That's an absurd anthropomorphism. And of course, one reason for this is divine infinity. You know, uh, a, a person is necessarily a person in relation to another. So you simply can't have an infinite uh, divine substance that is also personal. And of course, this is a debate that flares up not only in the uh, pantheism controversy, where, by the way, Lessing cites uh, Henry Moore or Heinrich Moore, as he calls it, uh, but also, then later with Fichte in the atheism yeah. controversy, yeah. where precisely this question of uh, the personal nature of the deity uh, emerges, and even more virulently in the theism controversy, uh, which is the ra in Munich, of course. Um, uh, uh, let's get back to the Heinrich Heinstadt, and then um, where where Jacobi. Uh, is a very significant figure uh, in um, Munich, and uh, I think uh, the uh, president of the Bavarian Academy, and I may be wrong about that, I'd have to uh, check it, but and Schelling was the general secretary of the yeah. um, Academy der Schönen Künste. Yeah. And uh, so, and in that context, uh, 
Jacobi accuses Schelling of pantheism and uh, after the uh, on human freedom, which I think Jacobi hadn't read. Uh, but anyway, so there's this virulent conversation uh, debate about the personal nature of the deity, whether that's conceivable. And many of these debates, I think, could be traced back, obviously, to the reception of Spinoza, but further back to these uh, issues that Cudworth is raising in the true intellectual system. It was a common insult at the time, though, to call someone a pantheist. Um, um, yeah. One of my teachers and good friends is uh, Max Gottschlich, who's in Linz, and he uh, always likes to stress that Plato was not a Platonist. But the uh, Cambridge Platonists were Platonists in, well, in what sense? That maybe we could uh, end on. How would you summarize the Platonism of the Cambridge Platonists? So um, how does their world look? Their vision? Well, the I, would, I would say that uh, they are Platonists in the sense that being is identified, I mean, ultimate reality with goodness, right? Yeah. And indeed that uh, freedom is an essential and inalienable part of human mm -hmm. nature. And that the... Uh, negotiation with the world in relation to the good and of course in the Christian context that's identified with God uh, is the defining aspect of our existence and indeed the uh, path to salvation so that I would say is is mm -hmm. you know uh, God-likeness is evidently a key part of uh, Plato's philosophy, the Homoiosis Theo, and the Cambridge Platonists, partly through this Alexandrian tradition, partly through the influence of the German mystics. So there was, uh, Henry Moore tells us that reading the German theology uh, uh, of of Tala and, and the Eckhart school was a key aspect of this Christianized Platonism, which I would say is essentially axiological. I mean, it's, it's essentially this um, conception that the universe is, however mysterious and troubling, the world may seem to us as agents it is grounded in ultimate and absolute goodness. Thank you very much, Douglas. Yeah, well, my pleasure.